Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his piece, Technologies of the Self, the first movement or tradition, the first approach that Foucault is going to examine is one that we can call Socratic or Platonic. It's perfectly fine actually to say Socratic slash Platonic if you want to. Both sides are, are equally important, I would say, in this. Socrates himself as a person, as a philosopher, is really a catalyst for a number of different important ideas and approaches just by the way that he lived, the stands that he takes, he is he's teaching in, in a certain respect and inculcating philosophy. But we wouldn't really have the Socrates of, you know, the Apology and the Alcibiades without Plato. And we're, we're getting a particular interpretation of Socrates through this. Because Socrates, remember, had many students who interpreted his, his uh, teachings and lifestyle and lessons in a number of different ways. So this is, this is a directly platonic one. And the two texts that Foucault talks about, one of them rather briefly, one of them uh, with a, a lot more care and attention, is the Apology and then the Alcibiades, which is attributed to Plato and may or may not be by Plato. We're going to talk about whether that matters in a bit. And you notice he's not talking about any other Platonic texts that might be relevant, the Symposium, the Republic, arguably the Mino in certain respects. There, there's a number of different ones that could have been brought in here. So we're going to not worry too much about that. The very first reference here is in giving examples of what the, the care of the self you know, was and how important it was for ancient philosophy. And so he says, in Plato's Apology, Socrates presents himself before his judges as a master of epimeleia, how to, that is the care of oneself, the care of the self within one. And he says, you preoccupy yourself without shame and acquiring wealth, reputation and honors, he tells them, but you do not concern yourselves with yourselves, that is, with wisdom, truth, and the perfection of the soul. Socrates, on the other hand, watches over the citizens to make sure they concern themselves with themselves. And Foucault says that, well, this is a very important and sort of determinative passage, and it shows us a particular way of understanding the care of the self. You know, what, what is going on here? Foucault isolates out several uh, lessons, we could say, three important things. Uh, his, his mission was conferred on him by the gods. He won't abandon it except with his last breath. For this task, he demands no reward. He is disinterested. He performs it out of benevolence. And his mission is useful for the city, more useful than the Athenians' military vi victory at Olympia, because in teaching people to occupy themselves with themselves, he teaches them to occupy themselves with the uh, city. So these are some important features, right? Socrates is doing public service by engaging in philosophy with his fellow citizens. And although he does have a preference for talking with younger people, um, he also talks with, with people who are his own age and middle-aged, people who are beyond the time period, the, the age, as uh, the Greeks would say, of youth. And so He's inviting his fellow citizens to care for themselves, not to care so much for honors, external goods like property, you know, not to worry so much about military victory itself, to worry instead about what it is that they are doing in relation to themselves, getting to know who they are 
truly are and what they truly are and, and changing it in the process to make it better, to nurse the, the wounded self, we might say, or the distorted self. Now, a little bit later in the text, uh, we get to the Alcibiades. And Foucault says the first philosophical elaboration of the concern with taking care of oneself I wish to consider is found in Plato Alcibiades one. Uh, the, the date of its writing is uncertain. It may be a spurious platonic dialogue. And then he says something kind of funny here. It's not my intention to study dates, but to point out the principal features of the care of the self, which is the center of the dialogue. Okay, so that, that's fine. You know, it, it may be a dialogue by Plato. It may not. Um, it's, a, it's ascribed to Plato. Is it that important that it's by Plato? You know, we could take a similar attitude to like, you know, people take with, uh, uh, you know, biblical books like, is the book of Isaiah really by one guy named Isaiah? Probably not, you know. Instead, it's by a school. And, and Foucault explicitly references a much, much later Platonic tradition, Neoplatonism, and he brings up uh, Albinius, and we could talk about others as well. This is a gap of centuries and I, I think it's good to signal here, without going into deep criticism, that Foucault is doing a little bit of you know, playing fast and loose with, with things here. Uh, that if the text is indeed by Plato, that, that's great. Um, there's some texts that we are pretty confident are by Plato, where the care of the self could also be ferreted out. Why is he focusing then on this one? Well... He says the Neoplatonists in the 3rd or 4th century AD show the significance given to this dialogue and the importance it assumed. They wanted to transform Plato's dialogues into a pedagogical tool to make them to the matrix for encyclopedic knowledge. They considered the Alcibiades to be the first dialogue of Plato. Not the first written, of course, but the first to be read, the first to be studied. It was the Arche, the starting point, the beginning point. In the second century, Al Albinus said that every gifted young person who wanted to stand apart from politics and practice virtue should study the Alcibiades. It provided the point of departure and a program for all Platonic philosophy. Now, we, we should say, okay, that's, that's at a certain point in time quite far removed from Plato, and they may be using the dialogue in a very constructive and, and creative way to do something different. Um, so it becomes central to later Platonist pedagogy and practice. And what we're talking about is, is a time when, you know, Neoplatonism is also competing with the vestiges of Aristotelianism, with skepticism, with Epicureanism, with Stoicism, with Cynicism, with all these, these uh, post-Platonic philosophies, right? Now, Foucault takes, a, I think his, his approach here is quite interesting. He frames it around several, in, you know, some good questions to ask. The first of them is why are Socrates and Alcibiades brought to this question? What's the context? And, you know, when it comes to Platonic dialogues, it certainly does help to know something about the people who are named, especially if they're historical figures with as rich a relationship to history as Socrates and Alcibiades. Alcibiades, by the way, is kind of a golden boy of Athens at the time. And he is a great story of, you know, rise and decline and fall. He's kind of a broken person at the end of his career, having managed to betray both the Athenians and the Spartans and the Persians, right? And to, to uh, really burn out in many respects rather than fade away. So he asks, uh, what are the reasons why Alcibiades and Socrates are brought to the notion of the care of the self? So this is taking place at a time when Alcibiades is about to begin his public and political life. He wishes to speak to, before the people and be all, power, all powerful in the city. He's not satisfied with his traditional status, with privileges of birth and heritage. You know, we often think of uh, Athens as a democracy, and there was democracy there. But it was also an incredibly, you know, stratified society as well. Coming from noble background was important, and Alcibiades has that. So Socrates uh, tells Alcibiades that he can no longer be the beloved as a young man. He must become the lover. He must be active in the political and the love game. And so Alcibiades is making a transition. 
And you can read the, the text. There's more discussion of that. I want to focus in on the very last point. The intersection of political ambition and philosophical love is the care of the self. So in the platonic perspective, at least, if you are going to be involved in politics, or we could say in society more generally, it doesn't just have to be what we think of narrowly today as politics, it could involve all sorts of other causes as well. The intersection between that and, as he says, uh, philosophical love, eros, desire, is the care of the self. Now, that doesn't tell us anything. That's a very nice slogan. What does it mean? Here we get to the second question. Why should Alcibiades be concerned about the care of the self? And we're going back now to the question that is being raised by, by Socrates in the Apology. Hey, dummies, why are you so focused on these things that don't matter as much and not on yourself? Why are you turning your gaze outward rather than re, you know, reflecting it inward on the kind of person you are, on who you indeed are, and whether you're in good condition or not? Why should Alcibiades be concerned? Why, and then why is Socrates such a busybody? Why does he have to mix himself up in this? And you know, here's one of the answers that's not given there. Oh, well, you know, I don't want my city to be a bad city, so I've got to go around and like, make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. That's not how Socrates frames it. He frames it in, in terms of the person he's talking to. He's like, don't you want to be a better you? Don't you want to actually understand why you make the dumb decisions that you do and you know, why your ideas are all mixed up? Isn't that a bad thing for you to be so confused or to be so confident about things that you actually don't know, right? That, that's something that runs throughout the Platonic texts. So why should Alcibiades be concerned? So there's a couple features of the dialogue that Foucault rightly brings up that I think are really central here. He says, Socrates asks Alcibiades about his personal capacities and the nature of his ambition. It, the ambition is one thing. Alcibiades has ton of, tons of that. Does he have the capacities to make that, those ambitions happen, right? And he says, does he know the meaning of the rule of law, of justice, or concord? Alcibiades clearly knows nothing. So do we want somebody like this actually being in charge? Does somebody like that actually want to be in charge, given how little he actually understands about what it means to exercise power? So... Socrates says, um, let's, let's compare our, your education with that of um, Persian and Spartan kings, your rivals. Spartan and Persian princes have teachers in wisdom, justice, temperance, and courage. Now, these are the cardinal virtues, right? We find these same four being discussed throughout Plato's corpus. And it goes on and becomes a major thing for both Epicureans and for uh, Stoics as well. You know, these, these four are singled out as particularly important in the Republic, in the Symposium towards the end, in both Agathon's speech and in, in Socrates' discussion of that, in um, you know, the Protagoras with the addition of piety, in quite a few places within Plato's corpus, these are the things that make a person good. And how do you have those? How do you acquire those? What, what is the nature of these cardinal virtues? Now, Foucault says something interesting here, that, and he's taking this from uh, the, the dialogue. He's, he says, Socrates tells Alcibiades it's not too late to help him gain the upper hand to acquire techne. So here's where we get technologies of the self, right? Techne is a, a word that we use. Oftentimes we'll translate it as craft or skill, art, right? Uh, it's a kind of disciplinary knowledge that allows you to do stuff. And although Aristotle is going to fairly rigorously distinguish techne from episteme, in Plato they're not quite so separated out from each other. So in, in order to acquire this, Alcibiades must apply himself. He must take care of himself, right? And... That in part, although it's not being sketched out here, is going to involve reference to these cardinal virtues. How do you acquire these? <laughs> How do you even know what they are so that you can begin measuring yourself against them and, and, and modifying yourself 
to have them. The third thing is, well, okay, so it's important to care for the self. What does that mean? There, and there's two aspects to this, two key parts. Well, what is the self? What is this thing that we're calling the self? And what is its care? So Foucault says, what is this self of which one has to take care? And what does that care consist? So what is the self? Self is a reflexive pronoun in, in Greek. And, you know, it, it is in, in uh, many other languages as well. Auto has two meanings. It can mean the same, but it also conveys the notion of identity. So the latter meaning shifts the question from what is this self to departing from what ground shall I find my identity? How can I figure out who I am, what I am, what I want to be, and how to get there? So he says, uh, there's a dialectical movement. When you take care of the body, you do not take care of the self. The care of the self is the care of the activity and not the care of the soul as substance. So we're, we're trying to figure out, well, how, how does one figure out what the self is in movement, in activity, in choosing, in the middle of the screwed up life that I'm already in and that I've, I've made a number of choices about, right? So there's a dialectical determination that's taking place. There's also a contemplation that needs to happen as well. He says, um, what does this care consist? You have to know what the, what the soul consists of. The soul cannot know itself except by looking at itself in a similar element, a mirror. So here's a kind of a leap. Thus, it must contemplate the divine element. In this divine contemplation, the soul will be able to discover, discover rules to serve as a basis for just behavior and political action. And so there's this contemplative aspect to it as well, which goes you know, back to the cardinal virtue of wisdom. And a bit later um, in the, the, the piece, Foucault is going to say, in Plato, the themes of contemplation of self and care of self are related dialectically through dialogue. And so this is a very important point, in part because Foucault frames it as if this is something that's, that's more platonic than belonging to these other perspectives, where, for example, you might just shut up and listen for a while before engaging and asking questions, you know, your relationship to the, the teacher, the, the master. In uh, Socratic and Platonic dialectic, there's a continual back and forth, a, uh, you know, reassessment, a let's figure this out together. And that can sometimes be missing in, in later uh, ways of understanding the, the care of the self. So that is uh, an important aspect. He tells us that there's four key themes or problems that are arising out of Plato's Alcibiades. And these are less sort of like, here, here's the answer, more like here's the questions you need to figure out through this dialectical work. So one is the relationship of the care of the self to political activity. Should you be politically engaged? Should you disengage yourself? Obviously, the answer from a Socratic and Platonic perspective is no, you, you need to be engaged in your society. That doesn't mean that you need to do every single thing that every politician does. There are some things that Socrates refuses to do and says, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like go around and try to get people to like me. Uh, that's, not, that's not my job. That's not my function, right? But there is this question of the care of the self and political activity. If we want to broaden this, we could say any sort of social activity. There's the question of the care of the self and pedagogy. And at first he says, he talks about it just as pedagogy, which places the emphasis on, well, how should we be teaching people to care for the self? A little bit later in the text, he, he identifies this as the relation between the care of the self and defective education, right? So that's interesting. And we should pause on that for a moment and, and consider that there's many ways in which education can be defective. It can be defective by just not being provided or being provided in too rudimentary a way. This is the problem with a lot of self-help, right? It's got all sorts of like, hey, you should try this in your life, and then it's very superficial. It doesn't really go any further. Um, but it can also be defective by giving you wrong-headed ideas as if they're actually the right ideas. And this is where, like, you know, the Socratic process of dialectic and, uh, you know, 
Socrates gets compared to a stinging creature that stupefies his listeners in the Minos. I brought up before the Minos, a good one for this. That's all part of this pedagogical process and the care of the self. You don't want to be wrong about things that really matter, right? <laughs> Including what really matters. Care of self and knowledge of self, these are closely connected in the Platonic thing. Foucault suggests that maybe knowledge of self, Knothi Seyalton, is, uh, is taking too much of a priority at some points. And then finally we have, two th he's got a theme that he identifies as a single theme, and I really think we could break it into two. Care of the self and philosophical love and the relation to the master. Now they could coincide. You're drawn by Eros to talk with somebody who knows more, like Socrates being taught by Diotima uh, about love in the symposium, in the story that he tells, right? Um, but they could be dissociated as well. You could have a philosophical erotics and they could also have like, you go and study with the master and sit there in silence to the lectures and then start doing the application exercises and they don't actually coincide. So I guess you could say the, the problematization of that could also be a problem itself. So this is what Foucault depicts here. It's a very incomplete picture, obviously, but he's not intending to provide a complete picture. These are sort of starting points for the care of the self in ancient philosophy.